Welcome to ASM Live, the internet talk show live from the 2012 general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology in San Francisco, California. I'm your host, Stanley Malloy. I'm chair of the American Society for Microbiology Communication Committee and dean of the College of Sciences at San Diego State University. Please feel free to ask questions throughout our conversation today. If you're live, you can raise your hand and we'll get to them. If you're watching us on video, please punch the chat function. And you can also send questions by Twitter to hashtag ASM2012. Please make it a conversation. We'd love to have you ask questions at any period of time. Uh, this se session of ASM Live is going to focus on microbes that are associated with people, how they talk to each other and influence their behavior, and how they influence us. And we have two guests this morning, Catherine Lemon from the Forsyth Institute in Boston Children's Hospital, and Karina Pokisava from the Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. So maybe we can begin, Catherine, if you could just tell us a little bit about your story. So my lab is really interested in understanding the interactions, the conversations that can occur between microbes that live together with each other on us. And we primarily focus on the human nostril, which is that inside part of your nose that you can reach with your index finger. Can um, you demonstrate that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my mother told me to stop doing that when I was about three. Um, so it's a very interesting surface. It's coated, it's basically a skin surface, but of course it has different exposures. We breathe in a lot of air, and with each breath comes microbes, so it sees a lot of tourists, microbial tourists. And also, um, as all of you probably know personally, it's downstream from a major site of mucus production, the nasal cavity. So it's gonna see different food sources. The bacteria that live in our nose, are gonna, they're gonna be a little different than say the bacteria on our knee or on our forearm. And it, it turns out that one of the bacteria, one of the bacterium that can live in the nostrils is very important medically. And this is the pathogen Staphylococcus aureus. It's a very common cause of infections from children to old people all over the world. And um, it's one of those pathogens, like so it causes disease, but most of the time it lives with us and doesn't cause us problems if we happen to have it in our nostril. We're interested in understanding how the other bacteria that are also there might you know, make the nose a more or less hospitable place for aureus to live. And we've done this first by asking about interactions that can occur between them that are mediated by little chemical signals, by small molecules is what we call them. And we have some evidence that some of the mm, benign or harmless bacteria actually make things that make aureus unhappy and stop its growth. So our, our long-term goal is to begin to understand more about these bacterial communities and how they work, and then to take that information and translate it into something we can use in the clinic. And you know, someday have approaches that would help us manage the bacteria that live in our nose and throat, and you know, be able to promote healthy bacteria living there and keep potentially harmful ones out. So this is really important because some of the Staphylococcus aureus are associated with serious antibiotic resistance, and yes. people are very worried about that too. Yeah, I mean, and probably um, many people in the audience will have read about methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and we've had the emergence of a, a epidemic clone in the U.S. and other parts of the world that can cause very severe infections. Mm -hmm. And Staphylococcus aureus is one of those human pathogens that has really eluded repeated efforts at vaccine development. So finding new ways to um, keep it out, to treat it, and to manage its behavior when it is there, help keep everything happy between us and it, would be useful, would be very useful. So how common is Staphylococcus aureus in people's noses? Ah. Well, because it's so medically important, people have done a lot of epidemiologic work on this. And uh, the data indicates that it, you know, on any given day in the U.S., 30% of people have it in their nostril. Yeah, it's a, a, a lot, lot of, of us. people for a potentially serious <laughs> right. pathogen. And most of the time, you know, like I said, most of the time it's well behaved. So if you're walking around with it, most days you have a good relationship with it. But on a bad day, and we don't actually understand exactly what makes it a bad day, it can cause severe disease in someone who carries it. So do you have insight into the kind of molecules that are changing the behavior of, of Staph aureus? 
we're just beginning to get a handle on those molecules. So we're just, we, we know that there are molecules produced by bacteria that don't cause a lot of infections, things like Carinobacterium and Propionibacterium that live in your nostril um, and can be part of the nostril community in healthy adults. We know now from work in my lab that we can show, you know, on a Petri dish that they will produce a diffusible molecule that inhibits the growth of Staph aureus. And the goal now is to identify what are those molecules. So to do this, we collaborate with a chemist, a um, gentleman named Michael Fischbach, who's at, uh, actually right here in San Francisco at UCSF, to identify those molecules. Because really, if we could know what the molecules are, we could begin to understand more about these interactions. So when you think about the future and, and what might happen in therapeutics, do you imagine that, that these molecules would be used or that you would just work on changing the populations of microbes associated with the nasal flora? Both. I, I think one of the things we imagine, as we know more about the human microbiome, which has been in the news a lot this week, um, we've begun to really imagine that we can develop what we call microbiotic, microbiota targeted therapeutics, which means when we target um, a therapy, right, is something you use for medical treatment, that we can develop ways to both do prevention by, you know, say, decreasing the number of people who have aureus in their nostril, which would prevent the infections, because if you carry it, you're at higher risk for infection. At least that's what the epidemiologic data shows. Um, and then, you know, that we could, so use the molecules to potentially change who's there or develop probiotics, other organisms that are potentially helpful that could take over that site and live there instead of aureus. Mm -hmm. now, now, this inhibition of Staph aureus, is that for all strains of Staph aureus, or is there a difference for certain types of Staph aureus? So that's a really good question, and we're still sorting that out. We know that the production of those inhibitory activities, that there's a lot of strain-to-strain -strain variation for the producers, the, the, I guess you can call them helpful bacteria or beneficial bacteria that produce them that, you know, the propionibacterium in my nostrils might produce this anti-Staph aureus compound and keep it out of my nostril, whereas the propionibacterium in, say, someone else's nostril might not. And that might change my risk versus that person's risk of having aureus in our nostril. That's the kind of questions we want to be able to ask in the long run. Mm -hmm. it, it, so another question is, does the flora in your nasal passage, is it simply influencing your ability to transmit Staph aureus? Or do you think it may also affect somebody's likelihood of being infected by Staph aureus? We, the data is definitely clear that it, that it, there's good data from epidemiologic studies that say you have to go in for cardiac surgery. If you have Staph aureus in your nostrils, you have a higher risk of having a post-operative infection, um, which has led you know, surgeons to try to decrease the amount of aureus in your nostrils by using topical antibiotics when they can before surgery if it's an elective event. So does that answer your question? Well, absolutely. So the, in, in other words, this clearly could have impact both on public health and on personal medicine. That would be in a cool. way, personalized medicine designed based upon the kind of microbial flora that you have in your nose. One of the really interesting things about Staph aureus, there, there's less data for, um, well, less data. There's no good, like, no one's ever done a long term study where we start with a lot of people at birth and watch them all the way through their life because that would take a long time. But people have looked at the rates of Staph aureus carriage in the nostril at different age groups. And it turns out the, the time, the window in life when the rate is the lowest is in the toddler years. So there, you know, when you look at that, you think, wow, if only 10% of kids at age one to three are carrying it. Maybe we could develop a way to help those people who are gonna eventually carry it as adults and don't as children, help kind of manage their microbial community development mm -hmm. so that they never carried it. And that might be a really beneficial impact on a large number of people. Mm -hmm. It's a great story. It ties in the whole um, process of understanding the microbiome with what seems like very clear and potentially not so far away therapeutics that could have an impact. So that's very you. nice. So, uh, Karina, maybe we can come to you. Could you give us a brief insight into what you've done? Yes, like Catherine, I'm really fortunate to be a part of the lab led by Dr. James Versalovic, uh, which is involved in the 
Human Microbiome Project that had a lot of attention this week, as you mentioned previously. And while some members of the lab are actually looking at the composition of human intestinal microbiota, I personally am more interested in understanding on the mechanisms of how these commensal bacteria interact with the human host. And the availability of the data that we have in the lab actually helps us to identify potential candidates that, um, that could benefit the health. <clears throat> and this actually data allowed us to identify a bacterium that produces a neurotransmitter, um, a molecule called GABA, which is aminobutyric acid, in other words. And what we found was very interesting that this molecule produced by this bacterium can actually stimulate cell surface expression of GABA receptors that are present on the immune cells that are normally found in our body. It's, it's a really exciting, it's a preliminary data, however, we're very thrilled with the results and it potentially could mean that some of these bacteria can actually reduce inflammation in humans, um, in particular in, in the intestine, because that's where we are looking for, um, for beneficial microbes. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting, because when you say neural transmitter, I think most of us would think, well, it will affect neurons. Yes. <laughs> but you looked at an effect on immune cells. Exactly. Well, aminobutyric acid is um, commonly known as a transmitter in neuronal cells that are found in the central nervous system in our brain, but also in enteric nervous system in, in the gut. However, a few recent reports suggested that some immune cells, like human myeloid cells, do express components of these um, neural and neurotransmitter systems like GABA receptors. So immediately we thought that, well, it would be really interesting since we know that some bacteria are producing GABA, it would be interesting to see if this microbial GABA can affect the expression of the um, GABA receptors on immune cells. And as I, as I mentioned, we were really thrilled to find that they do um, upregulate the expression of these receptors. So by decreasing inflammation in the gut, mm -hmm. potentially you would uh, decrease serious types of gastrointestinal problems, in including problems that are associated with long-term chronic gastritis, right? And it, so is that what you imagine? You imagine that, that these, the bacteria that produce GABA actually help keep us well Exactly. Well, it's, it, it's, it's amazing when we start looking at the composition of microbiota, not everyone realizes that we care about trillions of microbes in our gut. And most of these bacteria are actually considered to be good bacteria. They, they are like a few years ago, Dr. Shanahan uh, from Elementary Farm Biotic Center in Ireland named our micro, gut microbiota as a forgotten organ because every individual has approximately one kilogram of a biomass of these bacteria. It's a, it's a huge number of cells and the actual microbiome, by the way, um, or the, the combined, um, the sum of the genes of, of all these intestinal bacteria, consists of at least 200 times more genes than the human genome. So they, and all these genes are involved in benefiting our health. So our lab is really interested in, in inflammatory bowel diseases such as colitis, Crohn's disease, um, a huge number, a huge population all over the world um, suffers from these diseases. So we are hoping to understand a little bit more, more details on how these beneficial microbes can decrease inflammation by altering inflammatory cytokine expression. I, I think 
personally that this is a, an enormous change in the way you think about human health. We, we've talked for so long about beneficial bacteria and people speak of probiotics in yogurt, but it's been very difficult to know exactly how they're acting. And so insights into things like how this neurotransmitter would influence immune cells, it, it takes something that's very nebulous and hard to believe because you don't understand it and potentially gives you a concrete, solid explanation. So I, I think that's really nice. Thank you. Yes, we are, we're also very excited. This is a relatively new research, and we're still working on performing more experiments. However, we're really thrilled to come to this meeting and, and share these latest results with you. So, so what's the next step? Well, the next step will be, since um, we've noticed that the neurotransmitter produced by um, a bifidobacterial strain is increasing the cell surface expression of GABA-A receptors, as I mentioned previously, We're, we now want to look at how it affects the downstream, GABAergic downstream signaling in the immune cell. And that will help us also in, um, in identifying if um, this neurotransmitter can alter, as I mentioned, the cytokine expression by, by these immune cells, in particular pro-inflammatory cytokines. And if it does, then we can move to the animal model, um, colitis model, and see whether administration of this beneficial microbe can reduce the inflammation in the gut. You know, it's interesting because the way we started, you talked about microbes influencing other microbes, and you talked about microbes influencing the host. But if you really think about the microbiome as being an integral part of us, uh, the, the difference between those two perspectives becomes very, very small. Right? Except when you're talking about the gut, it would be hard to get a kilogram of organisms in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Right. So we welcome questions from our audience, both in person and out there in the ether. If you have any questions, please let us know. One minute for a mic. that have inflammatory bowel disease or colitis that they don't have these bacteria or they have a reduced number? Well, the latest data uh, from the Human Microbiome Project suggests that the GABB gene that is involved actually in conversion of glutamate to GABA is predominantly found in the, in, in the intestinal microbiome as compared to other body sites, which reinforces the, the importance of investigating and which also indicates that a significant number of intestinal commensal bacteria do possess ability to produce GABA. Um, the bacterium that we are looking at is Bifidobacterium dentium strain, um, ATCC27678 strain, which um, produces really large amounts of, of GABA, and actually the latest um, report by HMP Consortium that was published this week in Nature stated that B. dentium is commonly found in the healthy human microbiome, so it is considered to be a, an abundant taxa. I hope this answers your question. So. Karina, t tied into that question, I, I think the idea of how you discovered that that gene was so prevalent in the intestine is a really important point. Could you comment on that? Yes, um, it, it, it was a thrilling result. I didn't know what to expect, um, but again, I was really fortunate to be in the lab that is involved in the Human Microbiome Project and that we have people's resources who can understand and help us understand this huge amounts of data that is available. So we looked at the 
metagenomics data sets, basically this is this set of the data that has the set of all genes that are encoded by the enormous number of the microbes that are found in our gut. And we were particularly interested in, in GABA and glutamate decarboxylase gene is facilitating the conversion of glutamate to GABA. That's why we, we looked at it and fortunately we had the data for different body sites and it, it, it was amazing to see that the relative abundance of GAD-B gene was about tenfold higher in the gut as, as compared to, to other sites. So, um, I think the, the, this data that is available right now will, will shed a lot of light on what these beneficial microbes can do, at least in, um, in relation to the host. So, so one of the other questions is, you, you have the gene that does this mm -hmm. conversion. And so what about the substrate? What about the concentration of glutamate that's present in the gut? That's a great question. We also actually asked this question in the beginning of our study, and there have been, you know, some scientists have been speaking that GABA is present in the gut. However, we couldn't find any report which would state a definite concentration of glutamate or GABA in, in the gut. Therefore, we uh, performed, we analyzed feces of humans and also mice, and we found that in both cases we could detect abundant uh, concentrations of GABA and glutamate. However, glutamate was always at about 1,000 fold high concentration, and glutamate is a substrate for the conversion, so it actually makes sense that there is much more glutamate um, available for the microbes. Mm -hmm. Now, Catherine, when she speaks about the gut, this complicated metagenomics approach is really critical because there are so many different organisms there and the actual uh, density of organisms is so high. But, but in the nose, the populations of organisms are much less complex, right? Um, so yeah, they're different in that if you look in the nostril, again, if you look in the data from the Human Microbiome Project or from other smaller projects that were done before that looking at adult nostrils, you see that the nostrils actually has a lot of diversity of organisms that are detected, but the distribution is very uneven. So you have kind of three major groups of bacteria, which are the ones we focus on in my lab, that account for the majority of the bacteria in many people. And then you have a lot of things present at low abundance. And in, we don't know if those are tourists that came in with the last breath of air, or if some of them actually live there and play an important role. So it's, there are a lot of microbes in the nose, certainly a lot less dense. So it's a much sparser um, population than the gut, which is really rich with microbes. And this metagenomic data, one of the things that is so great about this data set is there's also metagenomics from the, for the nostrils, is that once we identify interesting molecules, we can find the genes responsible for their biosynthesis, and now we have this phenomenal data set. We can go into that data set and say, in how many people are those genes present, and is there any relationship between the presence of those genes that produce anti-Staph aureus mm -hmm. molecules and whether someone has aureus in their nostrils? It's interesting to think about the nostril and neurotransmitters because, as I understand, the uh, adsorption of molecules through the nostril has a clear direct path to the brain. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's a very interesting thing to think about, and it's one I don't think people have started looking at yet. I think studying the microbial community, the bacterial community in the nostril, I would say is... Um, hasn't quite reached the point of the study in the gut, but there's a lot of stuff we can do already from um, the metagenomic data. We know that there are molecules produced by organisms in the nostril, and we don't know what they're doing in the nostril. Like, what would that, organ what would that molecule do? How would it be helpful? Mm -hmm. um, so so if, if you were going to make a guess, this is always a difficult <laughs> prediction, and this is for both of you, <laughs> about how long it might take before these real basic research studies lead to some practical application? 
Right? I, I think this is something that the general public is always interested in. Invest a lot of money in research. But in the end, you'd like to see something happen. How far away are we from that? I personally believe that it, we're really only now getting this data from the Human Microbiome Project and, and the publications that came out last week were, were the very first publications. So it is incredibly helpful for us to have this, but as you know, the, the research takes time. So I believe another five to 10 years um, until we can see maybe the first solid results, until we can see those results. I, I would say, I mean, we are very early in mm -hmm. this type of research and I was thinking maybe 10 years. I think yeah. one of, like if you're talking about a small molecule product, of course, first you've got to identify the product that it's interesting, take it to animal studies, and then go through that process of showing that it's safe for clinical use. Um, so I think in terms of actual therapeutics, it'll be, it'll you be know, at least 10 to 15 probably, as yeah. normal. For actual therapies, yeah. things that, you know, you go to the doctor's office and they say, oh, try this salve. Um, but I do think that the, it, we are starting to see already a change in the thinking of scientists and clinicians. Um, I, I wear two hats. I'm a microbiologist and I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist. And I can see the change um, in my thinking and in the thinking of my colleagues about the importance of preserving the helpful bacteria under situations when we need to do antibiotics and realizing we don't have great ways to do that yet and we need them. So it's opening up new avenues of research. Um, and I think people are ready for, like, I think people who aren't scientists or doctors are ready for that. They, I get asked by parents all the time questions about why did my kid get this infection mm -hmm. and questions about, you know, how can I protect their gut when you give them antibiotics? Mm -hmm. So I think that we are going to see an increasing um, right. amount of data. 10 or 15 years isn't so far out when you think of any process of developing a new clinical treatment for humans. It's, that really is something I think that gives people a grasp that you'll be able to see the products of this research in your lifetime, which is a, a yeah, really something. <laughs> right? That's good. That is really good. We have another question from the audience. Hi, I'm Michael Schmidt from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, both topics are absolutely fascinating. And the whole issue of, of microbes and people always fascinate the general public. They fascinate physicians. They fascinate microbiologists. What are your thoughts, both of you, on first in nasal decolonization, where you physically go in and remove, and then going to the next level of thinking about taking out bad actors in the gut that may be responsible for things like inflammatory bowel disease or the setting the trigger for Crohn's or things along those lines. And I guess the way I'm going to tag the end of the question is, are we playing with Pandora's box when we begin to tinker with that delicate balance that is normal flora? So I... I can start with the nostril part of that because that is a very interesting question and it's something that clinically is already being done. There's specific situations where physicians try to eradicate Staph aureus colonization from the nostril or at least decrease the total number of aureus that are there. Um, so I think one of the things is to shift our thinking a little. I, I think of that approach as basically like I go out and I weed my garden and then I leave for the summer. And I, and I hope that what grows is going to be beneficial to me. And I think one of the steps that we'd like to add to the current approach is to go out and say, okay, we want to take aureus out before you have your surgery or if you're someone on hemodialysis who's at high risk for an infection. But we just don't want to leave what comes in its place to chance. We want to actually be able to add a small molecule that would you know, foster the acquisition of bacteria that would be more beneficial and keep aureus out on their own. Or maybe we even want to actually, in specific situations, put in a beneficial bacterium so that it's not just like having fallow ground where there's room for aureus to come back. And, and that's been one of the historic issues is that aureus comes back when you try to get rid of it. 
I would um, agree with Catherine. It, the same approach would work in the intestinal microbiota. Um, the current use of antibiotics washes out a number of beneficial microbes and scientists realize now, scientists and physicians, so to be able to nourish and maintain the, the normal human gut microbiota since early childhood really is probably the most important um, the, the most important topic for us right now, and, and it's important for scientists to understand what we have to do. And as I said, it's, it's, it's really, in, the studies are in the early infancy. We know that there are so many different microbes, and 90%, if not more, of those microbes are, are not culturable. We don't know what they do. So it's going to take a while for us to understand it, but we certainly can use the current low knowledge that we have to, to help and to, to have a balance in the gut. Just to go along with Stan's um, point about when are we going to see you know, therapies from these, I think it's important to emphasize that we already are have learned a lot from your work, and you know we know now that we can't overuse antibiotics, and that there are defined benefits that microbes give us, and we can characterize those. And if we just do an overall clearance in, of the, you know, intestinal or the intestinal microbiota or the nasal microbiota before surgery, we're removing the beneficial ones as well. So, I mean, you can comment on that, but I, I would just sort of say we, we already have practical benefits from your guys' work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Hi. Um, I was wondering, you said 30% of the population has staph aureus in their nose at any time. Um, is that like a random 30% or are there particular people that are prone to have it and generally always have it? Th that is a good question. Um, the simple answer is that any given day about 30% is what the large epidemiologic studies show. When you think about colonization, you can think about um, the data suggests there are two groups. People who intermittently have aureus in their nostril, people who have it for a long time, and people who don't seem to ever have it. Granted, that ever have it, those studies are usually done over only a year or maybe two years of time, so relative to our lifespan, relatively short. But I, for a lot of people, it probably kind of comes and goes, and that might be a very important opportunity for us to intervene because it means that person doesn't have to have aureus in their nostril. And um, when you said people who do have it are more prone to infection, like in surgery and things, um, is that particularly with staph aureus or with other things as well? Um, so generally it's with staph aureus or with site infections where they not always identify exactly what's causing the infection, but staph aureus oh. is a common cause of post-operative surgical site infections. And there's a lot of protocols in place that surgeons use to try to prevent just that type of infection. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. I, I, I just want to emphasize that we're going to hear some more about the microbiome in subsequent ASM lives. This is really a revolution in microbiology that will have a lot of impact in, in medicine over the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's just changed the way we think about things. So I, I want to really thank Catherine Lemon and Karina Pokisava for joining us today and providing insights into this important aspect of the microbiome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.